It's always nice having uh, applause before you've done anything. <laughs> so um, sometimes I find it valuable to, um, to take a concept that I thought I knew pretty well and just kind of step back and reassess what I know about it. And often I'll find that um, I discover something new. Today we're going to, to attempt that with automation. There's been a lot of talks about automation, a lot of good um, techniques for how to automate things well. And today we're going to, I'll try not to wander too much from the camera, um, um, we're going to look at some of the ironies of automation, things that you didn't intend to happen when you automated something, but that tend to happen anyway. So uh, my definition of irony here is going to be a combination of circumstances, the result of which is the direct opposite of what might be expected. Um, additionally, we might talk about a few paradoxes, seemingly absurd, though perhaps really well-founded statements. Um, both of those definitions and most of this content comes from a paper by uh, Bainbridge in 1983 uh, called The Ironies of Automation. Um, the computing industry was very different back then. Um, but there was also a follow-up paper in 2012 by a different group assessing what, how true those same concepts are today. And um, having read it and gone over it, honestly, everything they said in 2012 is still true today. So um, a lot of these concepts are spot on. And I invite us to all think about our own systems and think about how you can apply this and what you've seen, your war stories, your scars, et cetera. Um, we're going to do this in a three-act structure. So act one is the sorcerer's apprentice. Um, some of you may know this story. It's actually a very old story. It's been popularized by Fantasia, a, a Disney thing. But um, it's actually a much older story than that. And it's the story of a sorcerer's apprentice who is asked to take water from a well, and fill up this giant cauldron for his master. And he's been studying some spells on the side and thinks he can automate this. He um, takes a broom, and he casts a spell on it where it looks like that. It gets arms, and then he tells the broom, you take the water from the well and go fill up the cauldron for me. And then I can go sit in this comfy chair and not have to do it anymore. And it seems to be working well enough he sits in his chair, and he starts daydreaming, and he starts to imagine all the cool sorcerer things he might be able to do someday, and he falls asleep, because watching someone carry water is boring. Right? Chop wood, carry water. Um, unfortunately, he didn't give any stop command to the, um, to the broom, so the broom fills the cauldron, and then just keeps pouring more water in, and the whole workshop starts to flood. Eventually, the sorcerer's apprentice wakes up, waist deep in water, floating on kind of a raft of a chair, and realizes, I need to stop this. But he can't remember the spell to make this, the broom stop. So what does he do? He takes an ax and he chops up the broom into many tiny pieces. That doesn't work because the broom self heals. <laughs> and now, each of these splinters is now a broom with two buckets. And now they're all filling the cauldron. And so suddenly your automation has self-healed in an unexpected way. And just I have no idea how much water there would have been, what the rate is, but absolute chaos. And nothing got settled until the, the grizzled old veteran, the sorcerer himself, who designed the system, who wrote the spell, comes in and waves his arm and everything's fine. What does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with your work? Well, let's take a look at a couple things. Also. Quick note is that tweet there is from the individual who gave me this idea when I solicited on Twitter. Um, so there are some tasks left over after automation. Once you automate something, you're not, you're not done. You haven't made the toil or whatever it was go away. Uh, the first thing is, of course, monitoring. You've got to know whether or not the automation is working. And for humans, that is really hard. It is really boring. This is, right? That's what happens in the Sorcerer's Apprentice. He's sitting there, he's watching the broom, he falls asleep. If you have to monitor your automation, you have to babysit it, is a term we use sometimes, um, to make sure it's working, it's awful. Which is why we often have to then automate our monitoring, right? by putting it into our monitoring systems. Which is great, little cascading loop here, but it, the fact remains that it's additional work. Once you've automated something, you're not done. You need to be able to automate it in a sustainable way. Also, who monitors the mon monitors? Right, you can do this forever. What is the monitoring system for your monitoring system? How do you know when your monitoring system is working? Um, there has been a lot of talks um, in the past three days 
talking about tuning your alerts and what should you monitor and, and um, alert correlation and all of these other things, all of that additional work is because you automated things and that you're now monitoring them. So this is additional work you have to expect when you automate something. And another aspect is intervention. And I mean intervention in two particular ways. The first is intervention to fix the thing that broke. And the second is intervention to carry on the task that the automation was doing. So if your automation fails, you now have to do that thing manually or just let that thing fall on the floor until you fix the automation. And you might not be able to do that for a couple of reasons. And that's about your skills, right? Not necessarily nunchuck skills, bow hacking, you know, all those skills. But um, there are certain skills that atrophy after you automate something. The first is your manual control skills. If you used to do a thing a lot and then you automate it, you start to forget how to do that thing because you're not doing it anymore. The automation's doing it for you. So if the automation goes away, I don't know how to do the thing anymore. It's a side effect. The other is long-term knowledge of the system and how it works. I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but I certainly have, where I go a long period without being on call for a service, and then suddenly I am on call for a service, and I don't remember exactly how it works anymore. When, when you have knowledge of, of a way a system is designed and architected and the way it behaves, um, and, when, and you spend time away from that knowledge because you're no longer operating it, you're no longer in the trenches, you kind of forget. And so, again, these are just side effects, but they're things to consider. Act two is a story called The Velt. It comes from uh, a book by Ray Bradbury called The Illustrated Man, which is just a collection of short stories. And The Velt itself, and apologies if I'm spoiling this, but the story is twice as old as I am. And I'm not going to do it justice anyway. Um, the Velt is about a family that lives in a smart home. And this home does everything. It ties your shoes. It picks breakfast for you. It sings you to sleep at night. It, and this family, they have children. And the children are essentially being raised by this house instead of by the parents. And I won't get into all of the existential storyline here. But insofar as automation is concerned, um, these children become obsessed with their virtual reality room, which they have on a setting called the Velt. It's, it's the African Sahara, and there's lions and things. These kids are obsessed with watching the lions run around and eat things, and that's creepy to the parents. Um, so they decide they're going to go live in the woods. But the children beg them, please, can we just go in the virtual reality room one more time? And then they lock their parents in the virtual reality room with the lions, because they're because those kids are pretty sure that those lions are real. And this kind of automation side effect has to do with things like working storage. So that's the exact state of your system right now. In this example, the parents kind of didn't know the ex exact state of their children. The automation was raising their children for them, so they didn't understand what was going through their kids' heads anymore, what they liked, what they were bothered by, or what sort of people they were growing up to be. And so similarly, when you've got automation and it's working, and then suddenly it fails and you have to jump in and help, because you haven't been in the trenches, you don't know exactly what's going on at the time. Maybe you do understand the general way the system is constructed, but you don't know its current state. Um, traditionally, when there have been manual operators for things like complex trains or for nuclear power plants, they come in 30 minutes before their shift change. They, they can sit and watch the, op the operator before them and understand the current state of the system, its ticks and its behavior. Do you do that with your on-call shifts? Should we do that with our on-call shifts? I don't know. But it's worth considering. And going back to monitoring, this is just a brief point. Um, can you monitor something if you don't understand it? Oftentimes, fortunately, we automate something, and then we go and we do the monitoring for it. Because we wrote the automation, we kind of understand how it should be monitored. But if that's not the case, can someone who didn't write the automation and who doesn't understand it come in and know how to monitor it correctly? If the automation does the task better than you do, are you going to know if it's behaving properly? Brief interlude here, which is some potential mitigations. These are some recommendations from that paper, uh, which again was written in 1983, but we'll try to translate it into modern tech talk. 
Um, and of course, we all have our own mitigations we've thought of in the past. So first is degradation and shutdown. If your automation is misbehaving, and when I've been talking about automation failure, I don't just mean like the process fails. It could be like in the Sorcerer's Apprentice's case that it's just behaving in a way that is not desirable. Right? It's flooding your workshop. It's overrunning your, uh, your memory, et cetera. So can you afford to shut the thing down? If so, how quickly can you shut it down? If not, what can you do instead? Some of this is very familiar to us. Again, these are rhetorical questions. Think about the automation you deal with. Additionally, is there are things we can do to try and keep our skills sharp. The recommendation that came in 1983 was occasionally take over the process manually again, just to remember how it works. Sometimes that's not feasible in the tech world because we did the automation so it could scale, and I can't provision all of those VMs for you, but where possible, it's, it's, it would be the best way to regain that knowledge if you could do it. But if not, you have to go to lower fidelity types of things to relearn about your system and how it behaves. The, the, the example is training, and that's something we all try to do. Um, simulators work for pilots, for example. Can they work for us? I don't know. I've jokingly talked many times about having an incident manager tabletop or dice sort of game, sort of a D&D for incident management. I'm far from the only one, so don't give me credit for that. But uh, I don't know. Is that good practice? And when you do train, train on general strategies, on principles, on sound understanding, um, not on specifics. Training is not the same as run books. I'll say that again. Training and run books are not the same thing. Because you need to be able to train people to deal with the unknown and the unexpected. Right? When you're following the run book and suddenly it says, click this thing or enter this command, and that doesn't go to plan. And interestingly, we talked about like skills decaying of being able to do the thing or being able to fix the thing. Training, or the amount of training you need to be able to properly take over or fix a, an amount of automation is inversely proportional to how frankly, frequently you get alerts for it, how frequently it breaks. Right? If something regularly needs your attention, you're in there and you get a fresh uh, refresher on how it behaves and what it's for and what other things it touches. But if you never get any alerts for it, you forget. And that means you need more training than before. It's, again, it's, a, it's an irony or a paradox. It's something unexpected. So what else can you do besides training, besides run books, besides manual operation where possible, though it's frequently not possible at scale? You can study historical outage data. This ties back to things we've talked about before, right? Postmortems and all of that. Your postmortems, hopefully, the outputs from your postmortems are not write only. Often we write documents for postmortems just to file them away or just to show them to the executives or to have something that we can do to customers. Um, or just for the things we learn in the process of writing them, which is all valuable and very good. But if someone wanted to understand what happened in an incident a week ago, do you, have, do you have enough data that they can go learn about it? Because a good way to learn about the system, your, the way your system behaves, is to look back at the ways it's broken in the past. Now, certainly you can overfit by doing that, but it's a lot better than having to start fresh. And whatever you can do to rediscover your system, this is part of where the principles of like chaos engineering come in, where you want to poke your system in various ways and see how it reacts to learn about it, is that we all have mental models of the way our systems work. These mental models are not perfect, but they are often useful. Um, but over time, because of things we've talked about or for other reasons, our mental models stray further away from reality and from, from our fellow team members. So anything you can do to refresh and update your mental model, your mapping from how you think the system works to the way the system actually works, is great. So at this point, I want to kind of jump into a uh, quick question here. This is where I would like to see if we can, well, I don't see the microphones there, here. But what other unexpected things have you seen from automating something? When you've automated something in your system, does someone have an example? If not, we'll use it as a rhetorical question. But 
Have you seen something go not the way you thought it would when you automated? Silence is occasionally awkward in these <laughs> sorts of things, but I'm going to do it anyway just to give you time to think. I'm not expecting a hand, but think. If, if you've got one, please, absolutely. But, and I'll run over. There we go. Run, run, run. We had a lovely sorcerer's apprentice problem where we had a script to check for core files and transfer them to a development server for analysis. Mm -hmm. And then we used that script on a remote data center where the time to do the transfer was much longer. Mm. And so this script would repeatedly hit off transfers of the same core file ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we've all been there, but it's, it's something to remember things that you can get away with when things are local often you have to, th have to think more about when things are remote. Absolutely. It's a very good example. Thank you. And um, so I, I would invite you to think about things like that that you've, you've experienced in your organization. And if not, talk to the, the old veterans in your organizations um, or, or go out to, to Twitter or LinkedIn or, or your Slack <laughs> groups and, and learn from those who have automated things and then had them go sideways. Um, and one of the reasons I thought this was an important thing to talk about is uh, machine learning enables us to automate things we couldn't before. It, it's, I'm not saying it's just automation, but it enables a lot of automation, some of which is very powerful. And so these side effects are going to be much larger as well. I don't know how many of you follow the, what was it, I think it's called DevOps Borat account on Twitter, but a good quote from him was, to, to error is human, to propagate error to all servers in an automated way is DevOps. And so automation has the potential to take mistakes, I use that in a very fuzzy way, um, and amplify them. Machine learning will do that a hundredfold, and in fact, we've already seen many examples of that. So think about second order effects. This is my invitation for you, right? Second order effects, side effects, things beyond what you intended to happen in all complex systems, which all software systems these days seem to be complex systems. When you do something, it will have ripple effects throughout your system you did not anticipate. Think about them. You may not be able to plan for all of them, but you can anticipate some and watch for the others so that when they do pop up, you recognize them and you know where they came from. Um, this is simply a, an invitation to think a little bit more deeply about automation. And um, thank you all for listening to me twice. I'm surprised they inflicted me on you twice, but thanks for bearing with me. And um, this is the Ironies of Automation. I'm Tanner Lund. Thanks. <laughs>